In our New Testaments, we have two occasions in which Jesus Christ cleansed the temple, the temple of the Jews in Jerusalem. And some may argue, well, we don't have two times, we have just one time. But John, at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, after he had performed his first miracles in Cana, he goes up to Jerusalem for the Passover soon after that, at the beginning of his ministry. John is the only one that speaks of it in that context of time. Matthew, Mark, and Luke speak about when he came into the city of Jerusalem for his final time. He enters in as king. He goes up to the temple, he goes into the temple, and he cleanses it. I'm saying yet again. Their book ends of his ministry where he looks at his father's house and he says there needs to be something done of what they're doing in my father's house. At 12 years of age, he was one that was, Bob, don't you know I must be about my father's business? He was in the temple area. He was asking questions to teach the people. They were amazed at his answers. Do you know I must be about my father's business? Some translation would be my father's house. But it was a, it's a remarkable time in the life of Jesus. It's remarkable that he would be doing the things he's doing. I want us to see what that should mean to us. To see what it meant to him. And establish the fact that we're probably looking at two separate occasions. And understand why, Jesus, are you angry? Just why are you angry? Because you sure do show it. And what we find is that we have a wonderful window into righteous anger. There is a righteous anger. Jesus, who knew no sin, made to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God, Paul says, in chapter 5, and trying to get people to be reconciled to God through Christ. He never knew sin. He paid the penalty for our sins, but he never sinned. It's not a sin to be angry. And yet we find in our Bibles that anger and wrath will send us to hell. That should be sobering our, to our thinking. But Jesus allows us a window into righteous anger. And we want to examine what that should mean to our lives. When we look at this particular anger, we see in John 2, it's manifested. It's manifested in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the second occasion at the end of his ministry. We're going to look at both of them and realize just uh, the type of anger he shows on that occasion. Jesus Christ, and we see in the John, the second chapter, we're looking at verse 15 following, that he made a cord. He made a whip made out of cords. There are small ropes. The word cord there denotes cords, plural, and they're small. But he made a whip. He's very angry. He made that. He didn't pick one up. He made that on this occasion. Not only did he make a whip of small cords, he drove out the sheep. And have you ever tied into an oxen? He drove them out too. Now here were the animals that are going to be sacrificed. It's a time of the Passover. It's a time where people are coming from their pilgrimage from all over the Roman Empire. And the Jews will come up uh, to Jerusalem. And they didn't want to bring in sheep and oxen from Ethiopia. Or some other place. There was something going on here where they could come and Jesus says, here are the sheep and here are the oxen. He drove them out of that temple court. He poured out the money changers' money as they have them in vessels. He poured them out 
on this occasion. He overturned their tables. That's not somebody that's just a little upset. He is upset. He is angry. And no one on that occasion, if you'd have been in that area, you'd realize he is very angry. He's overturning tables. And that's just his first time. He continues those things when he comes out, uh, comes a second time to the temple at the end of his ministry. He cast out everybody. Mark tells us he even cast out the people who were buying things from the sellers and the money changers who provided the money for them in that currency of the temple. So he is driving out not only those who were selling, but those who were buying as well. Poor pilgrims, the Jews that come from such a long distance. He drives them out as well. He overturned the seats of those who were selling doves out of their little cages. That would be especially for the poor people who could not buy sheep or buy oxen. A lot of things going on in that temple and Jesus doesn't like it. And he's driving out everybody. Big oxen, bleating sheep, doves in their cages, and everybody that's selling them, and the seats and the tables and the vessels are just being turned upside down. It is a mess on this occasion. On this occasion. Jesus is furious. And anybody carrying a vessel throughout the temple, when Jesus comes that second time, he would not even allow you to take a vessel through that temple. I don't think they're bringing water. I think they're bringing money. He over poured out the vessels of their money changers. And when we pick up all of the times in which he cleansed the temple, these are the things that are occurring. And we realize this is a moment in the life of Jesus that we haven't seen. We're startled at the beginning of his ministry. Oh, he's so meek and lowly. He's the one that's so merciful. He's so, he's so enduring the pain that comes upon him. He is those, those things. He's, 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 he's one that, that you get to the end and he's, he's back at it again. At the end of his ministry, as he's going to be delivering himself up to God. And so we get an idea. And we would normally think, he is so angry. Why? Why is he angry? Well, let's look at the response Jesus made on this occasion. In John 2 and verse 16, he said, take these things away. Why, Jesus? Make not my father's house a house of merchandise, trade. It's an emporium. It's a bazaar. And there's people buying. There's people selling. Right in the temple courts. You know, you had the temple itself, the holy place, but then you had the temple courts. And that's where they're settled. That's where they're doing their business. Edersheim, in his study of the culture of the people at that particular time and, and the, the ways of the Jews, he speaks about the fact that during those times, they would set up their places of changing money to the temple's money and sometimes buying things. They would do them from cities to cities as they would come closer to Jerusalem. But we're in the temple courts itself. That's what Jesus finds. They're doing it right here. And we could argue, say, you know, that was convenient. That's caring for the people. We'll change their money into money of the temple right here. <laughs> and we'll give them their oxen or their sheep, those who have money. We'll give them their doves. We'll provide for them right now. That is a good idea, Jesus. Why are you so mad? Why are you angry? On this occasion, all Jesus says, 
is that you make my father's house a house of trade, marketing, business. You make it a house of merchandise. He doesn't speak about, on this occasion, if they're corrupt or not. He doesn't call them a den of robbers that you've made it. This is totally. You make my father's house a house of merchandise. That's what he's angry about. How important is the temple? Read 80, Psalm 84 and verse 10. For those who would be involved with the, the temple and Korin, the sons of Korah and all those things, is the deed of the love for God's house. A day in thy courts is worth a thousand days. Just a day. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell, to abide in the tents of wickedness. Just a day. Just a lowly doorkeeper. Because it's my father's house. It is where the authority of God lies. It's where the, it resides. It is where indeed people could pray toward the temple because that's where God's authority is. It's an opportunity for them to draw closer to God in all of his glory. And we've made it an emporium. The Jews had. No wonder the reaction of his disciples. How did they react? We've, you've already got a, a picture of it, and you could probably agree with them. What they saw that day with the fury of Jesus was, was one who's consumed by zeal, eaten up with zeal. There's nothing left of him. The zeal for thy house hath eaten thee up. That means it's consumed you. And there's not any Holy Spirit said, that's not exactly true. That's a little harsh. It's a little extreme. No, that's the way it is. Jesus, the Son of God, sees the very temple. Oh, it's not the rocks. It's not how grand it is. He, it's not that at all. It's, it's, in fact, this is my Father's house. And you've made it a house of just merchandise. Maybe exposing the greed that people had for money. And if that's the case, here is God's house for the spiritual well-being and the relationship of God and his people. And you use that as an opportunity for you to do business. To do business. They loved, he loved it that much like the godly people of old. John 2 and verse 15, at the end of that chapter, he, he, knew, he, he knew what was in man. And on this occasion, Jesus is going to expose it. And he does that in a remarkable way. But John 2 and verse 25. He himself knew what was in man. Oh, I knew they want to make him a king, but he wasn't going to be a king their way. He'll be a king God's way. But he knew what was in man. And he's furious. Of what he sees in man. And how they were treating the house of God. Paul speaks about people that use the word of God for gain, personal gain, monetary gain. We'll make money. We'll bring a lot of money for the coffers. We're just business. And they'll think godliness is just a way of gain. And you've got the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees. This is what they did, and he knew it, Jesus knew it. They will devour widows' houses and make long prayers in pretense. That's what the Pharisees did. They used the cloak of religion to satisfy 
and their desires of greed. And Jesus sees that and he's furious. You've made my father's house. And all the things about religion at this time of, of the Passover, you've turned it into just a house of merchandise because you don't have the meaning that you should have for God's temple. And he's angry over it. Can you imagine? They don't mind. There's no shame in the Jewish leaders that they will devour houses of widows. They don't have much money, but we'll take everything they got. Over the, over the cloak of, I'm a, I'm a gospel preacher. I'm a preacher of the truth. And uh, support me. And you'll just take everything they have. And when they stand before people, they will make long prayers. Oh, what a holy man he is. It's all pretense. It's all a game. And that's what Jesus sees as happening here. In Matthew 15, 5 through 9, can you imagine that a people that here's an occasion that the law of God, especially Pharisees who were, who were strict in accordance with the teachings of God's word, that they would act this way, but here's an occasion where you had a decision to make if you're just a regular Jew trying to live life according to law. And here's your father and your mother. They needed your monetary support. They needed your help. And you got the Jewish religious leaders. Give it to the church. You don't have to take care of your parents that way. Give us the money. Give it. It's Corban. A sophisticated name. It's Corban. It's dedicated to God. Give it to God. Of course, they would get it. And your mother and dad are not going to be helped. And that's not what the law meant. And Jesus exposes that on that occasion. You honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. In the pretense of offering the sacrifices and providing all the sacrifices, you were doing that in the temple courts and just turned it to merchandise place. When in reality, you're not sincere Jesus knew that. I think that's why he's angry. One of the things that he does when he comes down to, we want a sign. We want a sign. In another context, in Matthew 12, 38 and 39, there's a people ask for a sign. It's remarkable how Jesus responded to them. He says, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Why would he call it adulterous? It's evil. Well, I'd just like to see proof of who you are. Jesus had offered that time and time and time again. That wasn't their problem. And he knew it. He didn't play games. Jesus does not play games. He says, you're evil and you're adulterous. What does that mean? God ought to be your husband and you love money more than you love God. Your heart's far from him. You're an adulteress because you've got another God and it's your money. That's your desires. And that's what they're doing. They're making money. And you might think that's a good thing. It's convenient and it's all good. God ought to be pleased that Jesus is mad and he's madder than you've ever seen him before. This is just the beginning of his ministry. Jesus says, you've got to make up your mind. You've got to make up your mind whom you're going to serve. You cannot serve God and mammon. Do you see that in Luke 16, 13 and 14? You cannot serve God and mammon. And the next verse, verse 14 says, the Pharisees who were lovers of money, they're adulterous people. They have a paramour and it's not God. They got a lover, and it's not God. It's money. They were lovers of money. They heard these things and they scoffed at him. Yeah, that's all you can do. Because you're not going to humble your heart. You scoff at him. But he told the truth about him, didn't he? 
They were lovers of money. And on this occasion, what is their first response to Jesus when he does this dramatic thing? Well, what authority do you do these things to us? What's a sign that we can have from you to show us that you have that type of authority? He just did a remarkable one up in Cana. I don't know if word got back to him yet in Jerusalem. That was the beginning of his miracles. He would continue to do miracles and they would hear about that. But Jesus didn't play games on this occasion at all and what he gives them. All he says here was not that they're crooked. All he says here, you make my father's house a house of merchandise. Because the temple at that occasion was there in Jerusalem. It's where God's authority was. His name was there. It represented him and all of his leadership. And they turned it in to what I've seen in Pearland and what I've seen in others of these little farmer's markets where these little markets are selling their wares. And Jesus says, I'm mad. I'm furious that you treated my father's house that way. Traffic was everywhere. Buying and selling. All in the name of religion. But their heart was very far from God. And Jesus does what he has to do. Why are you so angry, Jesus, when you come into Jerusalem, triumphant? Oh, you're humble, riding on a, a colt of a donkey, and you come in as their king, and all the accolades that are taking place. And what is the one thing you do? He goes into the temple. And he, on this occasion, cleanses the temple both the people who are buying and both the people who are selling, you don't bring a vessel to the temple, we're at that time. And we find that all of the occasions of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew and Mark and Luke, they all give the reason this time, and it's not what Jesus gave the first time. That's why I think they're two different times. My house shall be a house of prayer. But you made it a house of merchandise. No, he doesn't say that. He says, you make it a den of robbers. There are two Old Testament passages that Jesus brings together on this occasion. If you turn away to Isaiah, the 56th chapter and verse 6, you'll see where Isaiah speaks about the house of God is a place of prayer. And I'll please just, the reason I want you to see it is because you'll see that it has far-reaching importance as far as God's people are concerned. And you and me uh, that way as, as, as well. But it says in verse 6, also the foreigners that joined themselves to Jehovah. To minister unto him, to love the name of Jehovah, to be his servants. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from profaning it and holding fast my covenant. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar. For my house shall be a house of prayer for just the Jews. No. Isaiah's looking where foreigners are coming. They come to, to Jerusalem. He's looking far down the line beyond the temple here. It was to be a house of prayer for everybody, which the temple, the church, the Lord, what he's going to establish through his death and his resurrection. And here's a case as he comes down here. It's to be a it's a place of prayer for all of his people. The Lord Jehovah gathereth the outcast of Israel, and yet I will give others to him besides this his own are gathered. It's going to be for all peoples. And the temple today is the, is the spiritual body of Christ. We individuals have, our, have the temple, the holy place in our physical bodies. Not the direct presence of God, but he directs this body through his word. And the spirit dwells in us. I've got to keep it pure. But on this occasion, 
Here was the temple that was established. You have turned a house of prayer. That bringing people close to God. You made it a place of merchandise. And he's not ignoring that here because the people who sold. in Not in John's account, but in Matthew's account, those who were buying and selling were driven out. Just the ones who were selling, driven out in the first time he came. So I'm not saying that that has ceased to happen, but what's happened is that you make it a den of robbers. Turn with me to Jeremiah, the seventh chapter, in verse 11, where Jeremiah in his day had problems with the people of God and the way that they were conducting their lives. They had not gone into Babylonian captivity. They will if they don't change their ways. And God was going to bring them into judgment. But Jeremiah 7 and verse 11. Is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I even I have seen it, saith Jehovah. Den of robbers. What's that mean? Verse 8. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal? Will you murder? Will you commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense and the bell and walk after their gods that you have not known? Or come to stand to me in this house which is called by my name and say we are delivered that we may do all these abominations? One of them is stealing. And so we ask the question, were these dishonest money changers? You had currency had to be exchanged. If we go to a nation, our dollar won't buy anything. We've got to convert that. People can make money off us. I remember in, being in Colnes and Lithuania, and the, the, our dollar was changing value all the time. And you say, well, well got a little, I need to go exchange some money so I can get some money to buy something in Lithuania. And it was changing all the time. And I didn't argue about it. I just think that's not fair. No, you do what you do. And here you are. You want the sheep or not? This is what you're going to pay. And it was, it was, it would be easy for them to change that. We know they're lovers of money. We already know what they are. And at the end of his ministry in three years, it hadn't changed. Were they dishonest money changers? Were they dishonest sellers? I'm not saying they didn't sell sheep that was not ripe for sacrifice. And they even had men that would spend 18 months studying how to do that. How to make sure that was a, a sacrifice pleasing to God. To spend 18 months studying what a sheep without blemish. They were, they were, they were very religious. They were very strict. But were they dishonest in that? You got them. You want this oxen or not? Pay up. And I think he calls them robbers for a good reason. That's why he's angry on this occasion. They made it just a house of merchandise. And they make it a den of robbers. Jehovah saw it in Jeremiah 7. His son sees it in the first century A.D. It had consumed him because of his love for God and his love for his house. How did the Jewish leaders react and what was Jesus' response? I've already said by what authority do you do this to us? To me, that's an interesting reaction. I don't see Jesus having anybody said, bro, you're not going to do that to my table and have a big scuffle. He drove them out of the temple. I imagine they were astonished. But the response was, but what authority do you do these things? And I want us to pursue that a little bit. 
Notice what they do. They did it like the lady at the Samaritan well. They do it like everybody does, one time or another. To turn the problem that they really had, and they turn it to a knowledge problem. It's, I'm not so sure you have the authority to do this. It wasn't what they were exposed to doing. You made it a house of merchandise, and you're a bunch of robbers too. You put both of them together. They do what many do. They turn it to a knowledge problem, when in reality they don't believe the truth, and they're not living according to the truth. And when you do that, you divert it. Well, I just don't understand all that. What's the problem? What's the issue here? The Sadducees did that. They don't believe in the resurrection. They do not believe in angels. They do not believe there's going to be a bodily resurrection. And when Jesus, they came before Jesus to ask him questions, they give him a problem. A lady was married to seven men in the resurrection. Who does she belong to? Answer that, Jesus. No, why don't you answer the problem that you don't believe the truth of the resurrection? No, we're going to divert it. We're going to divert it to say, we got a problem. And it, have all authority, ask the authority for what you do. That's a good place to go. But I'll tell you one thing they didn't do. They didn't admit the fact that I've got a heart of greed. And I don't mind cheating somebody, even devouring widows' houses to get money. That's what they were inside. And Jesus knew it. And like many do, they deflect a lot of truth away from the heart that has been exposed. And they didn't argue how honest they were. They didn't argue that we've got an emporium going here in the temple grounds. And some rabbi stood up to us, named Jesus. And it's just interesting, their response. It's like so many. What does Lady at the Samaritan well? When Jesus was getting deep into her heart of reality, she tried to divert it. Well, some have said we worship in this mountain of Gerasim. Some said we mentioned in Jerusalem. What do you think about it, Jesus? I have a knowledge problem. No, you got a heart problem. And the problem is you don't love the truth. You don't love the reality that God sets before us. And it's just interesting what the response is. And it's interesting what Jesus does. Turn with to Matthew, the 12th chapter. We, we brought this one up a while ago, where Jesus is involved in setting forth, uh, as, when people say, we, we want a sign from thee. What sign do you offer us? Now, this is, Jesus has been into his ministry. <clears throat> He's been doing miracles. He calls an evil and adulterous generation that they're not really wanting that much information because they're close to God. They're, they're trying to cover up some things here. So how does Jesus respond when they ask for a sign? And he said, well, evil and, adulter uh, evil and adulterous generation seeketh that their sign. But there's no sign shall be given thee but the sign of Jonah. That's what I'm offering you. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, great fish or the well, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's what I'm giving you. The sign of Jonah. Jonah himself was a sign because he was vomited up on the, on the shores. They knew he ought to be dead. And here he comes. I think we're going to listen to that message. So if he was resurrected from the dead. He's there three days and three nights. If we find Jesus is going to be three days in the hearts of the earth, he's speaking about his resurrection. That's the only sign he's leaving for the people whose heart is so far removed from God. And they're proving it in how they respond to him. That wasn't a great response. Jesus did all of that. And that's how they respond. But that's the way men do. It is a knowledge problem. No, it's not a problem. It's a heart problem. And we can bring up things. And Jesus saw that. He said, the only thing you're going to get now is that I'm going to be raised from the dead. That's the only one I'm offering you. This other stuff is play stuff, and I don't play games. 
John writes his, writes his gospel, and we know from John 20 that the things that these things that have been written, he did so many signs, but these have been written. These signs are here and we're recorded, so you'll believe and have life in his name. And they were using it for diversion to their heart problem. What does he give on this occasion in John 2? He gives them a resurrection sign. And what he says, Jesus answered them in verse 19, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Would you instruct Jesus? Said Jesus, we've been talking about the temple. You cleanse the temple over here. You need to be more communicative with your audience. You need to realize they may be on a different track of mind. You might want to just kind of lead them into this point. Because <laughs> you know what they're going to think? They're going to think about this temple. Jesus doesn't care. In all the parables, they see the story. They turn their backs upon those things. And what he said, I'm going to give you what I've given others, the sign of Jonah. But he said, destroy this temple. Did he point to his body? I don't know. Did he point to, was he trying to confuse them? I don't know. But how did they respond when he said that? Maybe Jesus should have heeded your advice to tell how to communicate better with your audience, teacher. Destroy this temple three days, I'll raise it up. The Jews therefore said, 40 and six years was this temple in building. They're thinking about the temple, aren't they? Stones. 46 years of this building, and wilt thou raise it up in three days? She said, no, no, I, I misspoke. I, I'm not a real good teacher, you know. I, haven't, I didn't do this very well. Let me back up. No, he let it lie. He let it go. The Bible says he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, this is John 2, when he was raised from the dead, after he will cleanse the temple the second time, after he's raised from the dead, when he goes through his trial, which is, which is a sham, they already knew what they're going to do to him. He did too. After his death on the cross, after his three days in the heart of the earth, after his resurrection, the disciples remembered that he spake this, and they believed the scriptures and the words which Jesus had said. They remembered it then. He was talking about the temple of his body. Isn't it interesting that in derision, at his trial and at the cross, people would use that against Jesus. He, destroyed, he said, you know, destroy this temple, he'll build it in three days. See if he can save himself. They would use that terminology. And yet it was so true. He raised himself from the grave. I have the power to lay it down. I go to John 10. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up. Nobody took it from me. And I'm going to take it up again. He's God. He is finished with people with closed hearts. Who diverge things and make it a knowledge issue instead of a character response as they should and that's all he gives them that is indeed his reaction and it'll take time for they'll realize his disciples knew that he he knew that after it happened all these things were fulfilled but jesus did make a spectacle of himself on this occasion one who's meek and lowly and gentle didn't look so gentle on this occasion. Twice. And it was all connected with the temple. In the face of the Jews' indignation, this is the second time he cleanses the temple, and while he's coming into the, the city, and he's doing these things, there are people that have been hollering and praising him in hallelujahs unto Jesus in Matthew 21, 15, and 16. And when they are doing that, now the Jews are very mad at him. He's cleansed the temple, but when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children that were with him crying in the temple said, Hosanna to the son of David. 
They're crying in the temple. And they're praising Jesus. It made the people, the rulers, moved with indignation. Who's angry now? It's the Jewish leaders. And he's exposed their heart. And they don't like that light shining on that, so they divert it. But what authority do you do these things? And their heart's so far removed from God. What does Jesus do? He points them to Scripture. In Psalm 8 and verse 2, from the mouth of babes, it has perfected strength, the psalmist says. We see it here, they perfected praise. What a strong passage. In the heat of others' anger, Jesus is still pointing them, trying to help them see the truth. And the fact that I'm not going to stop them from speaking and praising God. It is simply perfecting strength. It's perfecting praise. What the mouth of babes do because they're innocent babes. But what you fail to do because you are an adulterous generation. And you love money. And you feel greed. And you use religion to cover it. And that's the end of the text. <laughs> but what we are, we're still, we're still dealing with this. What about this? That's Jesus. And I want to close by looking at the aspect of anger. It's a window into righteous anger that we can have. What can we learn about this occasion on the subject of anger? Well, let's don't sugarcoat it. You talk about a fella eating up with things. This man is consumed with this. It's, for, it's, it's what the scriptures say. The zeal for thy house hath eaten thee up. What does eaten up mean? Well, I got a little interest in this. No, it devours me. Well, that may be a man out of control, isn't it? Who said? You don't see Jesus out of control. You don't see Jesus that people out of control do when they're angry. But this is pretty, it's kind of walking a fine line, isn't it? Because he looks like he's real angry. And we might say that he's sinning. He didn't, he never did. I'm telling you, it's a window into righteous anger. The world may not be able to understand. But we should think about it before we leave this world. I, I don't think I could do that very well and still be sinless. Only Jesus could. Well, it looks like Jesus is furious. And he doesn't normally turn over tables and turn over his chairs and pour out money out of vessels and drive out big fat oxen and sheep and everybody that's in that place. He cleans house. He would be a terrorist in the temple. We got a terrorist amount us, about us. Very definitely, he would go down. Look what he's doing. But look what he's doing. That's what we're trying to see. Godly anger. In Psalm 86 and verse 15, I tell you, God's anger. And he's slow to anger. And he has these other qualities that are there as well. But thou, art Lord... Are, are a God in, that's merciful, that's gracious, that's slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness and truth. Probably faithfulness would be a good translation of that. Of, of loving kindness, and he's faithful. But he's slow to anger. Did Jesus just fly off the handle? 
Who got in his face and made him angry? They flipped the tables. Nobody. He didn't bring in an army of people to overcome the temple. It wasn't an insurrection. It wasn't clamoring and hollering and raising your voices. What do you think like that? And he did just quickly lose his temper. He had enough of hypocrisy masking around as God's religion. And he wanted to let them see what God's son thought about it. God is slow to anger, but he is fiercely full of wrath on the day of judgment. But he's slow to get there. And that's what we've got to be. Want to be godly? You be slow to anger. You hold that anger. When the reaction is, I would just fly off the handle. Jesus didn't fly off the handle. He's stopping them for being having merchandise. Their money's on the floor. It's been poured out. The tables are not there. I mean, it is a mess now. He's driven all the animals away. What are you going to sell today? And the sellers, when he comes a second time, are not only driven out, but also the buyers. It's not going to be a place of merchandise full of people who cheat. Your Jewish leaders. Yes, he's consumed with zeal. But you wouldn't say that he's quick to anger. And be fair with the text. And be fair with the life of Jesus. Thirdly, the Bible says to be angry and sin not. Ephesians 4 and verse 26. Because the verse also says, let not the sun go down upon your anger, on your wrath. He uses a word that's only found there. The wrath shows you there can be an anger that is just seething and just boiling and you don't deal with it correctly. He said, deal with it before the sun goes down. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Because it can be something that is translated into get even. To be able to have malice in your heart towards somebody. Because you don't deal with it constructively. It's great for relationships, especially for marriage. We're not going to go to bed angry, babe. It solve our problem. But he says, you be angry. There is something that God has placed in us, and there is a righteous anger that moves us to do the right thing. And when we lose control of that, when we are quickly angry, at a drop of a hat angry, that's when we've sinned. Jesus didn't do that. Doing good is not always gentle. Doing good is not always gentle. And that's something our culture needs to understand about God. And Jesus is certainly not gentle. And if you think that, then you're going to look at Jesus. He had a whip. Maybe sharp cords. But he just didn't drive them out with the authority of his voice. Wasn't shouting and clamoring. What we can see here. But he drove them out. He had a whip. And he turns tables over. And that's not enough. We'll turn, off the, turn over the chairs of those. Look at that guy selling doves out of that cage. With short, just turn over his chair. Drive out all the animals. That's not gentle. But it's good. Because he was giving them a moment that here is the perspective of God. And he's not pleased. He's not pleased. Titus 1.13, we see that, that we can apply to our lives as well. Paul tells T Titus, as he's on the island of Crete, in the context of false teachers, in the context of, 
of teachers who are deceiving others with their, their teaching. He says you're going to have to stop their mouths to keep them from doing this. How do you do that? Reprove them sharply in verse 13. That's not gentle. Reprove them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. That's good. But it's not gentle. In 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, we read where Paul describes himself as being a father of the Corinthians in verse 14. I write unto these things to shame you, not to shame you. That's being mean. To shame him. So I'm going to angry and shame a person. That's not godly. But Paul says, I, I didn't do it to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. Here were Jews in the church there that were denouncing Paul and his authority over them. And he said, I beget you through the gospel. You're my beloved children, and I'm not here to shame you, but to admonish you. But there are people that are saying that he's not going to come. He doesn't have the, 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 the power to, or the bravery to come face us. He says, verse 19, but I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will. And I will know not word of them that are puffed up, but I'll come with power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. That confirming power that he is an apostle of God. What will ye? It's up to you. I'm coming. What will ye do now? Shall I come to you with a rod? That's not gentle. Paul said, that's right. Are in love. And a spirit of gentleness. I thought that's the only way to be. Love and gentleness. No, there's something called righteous anger. And there was the rod of correction. He said, I will come those two ways. Both of them are godly. But I don't know about you. I, I, I was beaten by would by coaches and I remember being spanked by my parents with that but a belt is leather <laughs> and that wasn't gentle but it was good and we've got to get that in our thinking this is not a complicated example in the life of Jesus but it's different. And while Jesus was slow to anger, this is how he stopped what the problem was. And they never said, you've misjudged our hearts, Jesus. They never stopped him, as far as we could tell. I'm sure they just cannot believe our little emporium is kind of a mess right now. And it's him. And he's driving them all out. No, no, gentle. But good. It didn't turn out the way Jesus would want that. To people repenting and exposing the error. And they turned their hearts to God and all of those things. That didn't happen. But for a moment in time, at the beginning of his ministry and at the end, he exposed the hearts of ungodly people masquerading, masquerading as God's religious people. It was a sham. And the only sign he's going to give them is resurrection. I would hope there were some Pharisees in that 3,000 number in Acts 2 that really repented and didn't become an adulteress of God because they loved this world. They truly loved the Lord that can remember. We didn't have a high regard for God's house. And we were robbing the people. 
I thank God now for the salvation that this Jesus has provided. I would hope there'll be some of those. I know one Pharisee that became a pretty good Christian. He was the one that says, I'll come with a rod or love and gentleness. Didn't mean he didn't have love for seeking their well-being, but love and gentleness. That's what we want to focus on. There's also the rod. There's also the cleansing of the temple. And there's not a thing about that that you can sit there with Jesus just really wasn't angry. He's furious. Well, he still was composed. Yes, but he was eaten up with zeal. His whole being was involved on this occasion. And we sometimes think that person is sinfully angry. It's not. It's just not gentle. But it was instructive. This evening, I hope that we will not be molded by this world, even this religious world, that may have a concept that if you're teaching God's word, you know, the idea of always being gentle and loving and tender, and if you're not, that you're not a good teacher, you're not a Christian, I hope we'll remember Jesus. And apparently two occasions, beginning and the end, he started his ministry, ended it, letting people know he shines some light upon their heart. It wasn't a knowledge problem that this is so complicated. Is that they did not love God enough to change their heart. I hope we'll never do that. I hope we'll never do that. Jesus never sinned, but he tells us that anger has its place. And we must not soon be angry. And we must be involved that this is being accomplishing, is accomplishing good. And sometimes standing up to the authorities. And all their hypocrisy is needed. And the Son of God did that. He's worthy to follow. He's the only one that can save you from your sins. If you have never come to Christ and confessed who he is. And be repenting of your sins and baptized for your remission of your sins. We're here to assist you that that can be accomplished this evening and start walking with the Lord. Full of zeal. Totally dedicated to serving God. Working on things that might be in our character. That's not what it ought to be. and Just keep working on it. Because we have a wonderful example in Jesus Christ. Be angry and sin not. He was angry in Mark 3, 5, and he grieved deeply because he saw the hard-heartedness of people. Do we care about God's truth that we'll get angry over some things? hope so, because that would be the godly response. Won't you start walking with Christ? You'll never regret it. We can help you in any way in obedience to the gospel. Come as we stand and as we sing.